Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Human beings, by nature, are social creatures. One of our most basic and primitive needs is to connect with others. When the telegraph was invented in the 19th century, it changed everything. And all the innovations and communication that followed served the same purpose, to bring people closer together. Some of you have probably already heard about Facebook. We record our lives, we interact with others, and without a care in the world, we share our personal experiences online. You could say it's a modern version of the old primitive need. I tweet, I post, I blog, therefore I am. But all of this sharing comes at a personal risk. If you don't believe it, ask the man at the top. I want everybody here to be careful about what you post on Facebook. I remember believing in the early days that Darwin would have an effect. People would learn from their past mistakes, and I'm afraid it's not happening. People are basically still cavemen in front of their computer keyboards. They're Neanderthals. Cavemen or not, nothing in the world, absolutely nothing, is attracting as many users of social media as Facebook. Facebook is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game in which the objective is to collect friends. You're not anyone on the internet if you're not on Facebook. Simply put, social media is changing the way people interact. In many cases, it's a bumpy ride. All that personal information being shared with people we've never even met, with consequences down the road that are impossible to predict. It's crazy, really, when you think about it. We call it Facebook Follies. More and more, Facebook is being used to share information about upcoming events. Weddings, gatherings, concerts, and especially parties. Recently, a girl in Germany used Facebook to let her friends know she was turning 16. She forgot to check the privacy settings and the party invitation went out to everyone on Facebook. Whoops. Thousands of boisterous teenagers showed up. Desperate public announcements by the family that the party was canceled made no difference. Facebook had worked its particular magic in bringing people together. from Facebook. Uh, she tells that uh, there's the party right now here, but I don't get in. The birthday girl, 16-year-old Tessa, was nowhere to be seen. She had fled to her grandparents' place earlier in the day. One careless click on Facebook a momentary lapse by a 16-year-old, a lifetime of Facebook notoriety. Every day, millions of potentially damaging invites, photos, and messages are uploaded to Facebook for the world to see. And when private thoughts are put on Facebook, watch out. The Royal Wedding of William and Kate, April 2011. A ceremonial occasion, if ever there was one. And a prestigious moment for the various regiments in Britain's armed forces. Amongst them, the much-decorated Scots Guards. Being selected for active duty on a day like this is a big deal. One guardsman who didn't make the cut, 18-year-old Cameron Riley. And all because of a posting he put on his Facebook page. In a spectacular display of bad judgment for all the world to see, Riley called the bride-to-be a stuck-up cow. For good measure, he threw in posh bitch and 
Who really gives a f about her? For this indiscretion, Riley was removed from royal wedding duty. It's a story that will likely haunt his entire military career. Or what's left of it. Another Briton who probably wishes he had kept his thoughts to himself is 26-year-old accountant Paul Chambers. Chambers had bought a ticket to fly from a small regional airport to Belfast to visit his girlfriend. Nine days before he was due to fly, the airport was shut down by a snowstorm. Chambers decided to send the airport a friendly warning via his Twitter account. Crap, Robin Hood Airport closed. You've got a week and a bit to get your shit together. Otherwise, I'm blowing the airport sky high. Bad idea, Mr. Chambers. Because of the public network used to carry the tweet, airport staff were alerted to it, and they failed to see the joke. Chambers holds the distinction of being the first person in the UK to be prosecuted under the Terrorism Act for remarks made on Twitter. Because of all the fuss, he was fired from his job as a financial manager. So, what was he thinking? Clive Thompson is a freelance journalist. His expertise is the internet and how it's changing the way our lives are being recorded. You look at the actions of this guy and you sort of shake your head and you're like, are you some sort of an idiot? Uh, but then you, you, on the one hand, it's like, well, he's just, in this, he's just in this collision point in society between a world where if I say something, only the people in my room are gonna hear it, and uh, where if I say something on the, online, everyone's gonna hear it. And he hasn't quite got his mind around that yet. In the end, the judge fined Chambers the equivalent of $1,500, and he was banned from the airport for life. Unrepentant, Chambers responded to his conviction in yet another tweet. I'd like to thank the Crown for their level best efforts in f***ing up the life of an ordinary citizen. I love Britain. It's not just ordinary citizens who get tripped up on social media. It happens in the nation's capital, too, affecting people who you might think would be more savvy with their tweets. Well, it turns out... Mr. Speaker! That's not necessarily the case. Be in order. Enter U.S. Congressman Anthony Weiner. He found out the hardest way possible that tweeting this picture of his package was a colossal blunder. I'm deeply ashamed of my terrible judgment and actions. Inevitably, the congressman was forced to resign. And everywhere, people shook their heads and asked, what was he thinking? The fact is, many people appear not to think before they send out a tweet or post something on Facebook. They are taking a huge risk because you never really know who your friends are. Here in the peaceful heart of the English countryside, there's a battle going on. It's a global war over privacy and personal information. Inside this custom-built state-of-the-art facility, a company called Sophos intercepts computer viruses of all kinds. The company's job is to protect some of the world's largest corporations and government departments against cyber attack. Every day at Sophos, they see the unhappy results of people being careless with personal data. Graham Cluley is one of the company's senior technology consultants. Part of his job is to keep a close eye on Facebook. What most people don't understand about Facebook is it's not being done for love. It's a business. And it's not even free. You may think, well, I'm not paying for this. Well, you are paying for it. You're paying for it with your data. You're giving away personal information, which is a commodity to Facebook, which they can sell onto others. So you actually are the product which Facebook is selling. You, the product, along with your date of birth, your likes and dislikes, your email address, your interests and hobbies. Sofa suspected that as a rule, Facebook users are far too loose about giving away their personal data. To prove it, they created a Facebook page for a small plastic frog and invited 200 complete strangers to become Facebook friends. Almost half the sample jumped at the chance to share their personal information 
with Freddy the Frog. Their full name, list of friends, educational information, on and on they went. There's a general problem here, though, that people don't seem to understand, that your private data is private for a reason. Once it's on the internet, you can't ever drag it back. It's out there forevermore, and that's it. You've lost it. I mean, someone else can steal it in future. It happens all the time. Computer hackers and fraudsters stealing other people's identities to make money. And more and more, it's happening on social media. It's a truth of human history that whenever a new technology comes along, one of the first people who are going to exploit it are criminals because it gives them a new way to reach into people's lives, to gull them, to dupe them. Uh, and you saw that with email, you know, like uh, uh, scam email things. Now we're seeing it with Facebook. Brian Rutberg knows a thing or two about internet scams. For years, he worked at Microsoft as a communications director. In 2009, his Facebook page was taken over by a professional hacker. Beautiful. My daughter was doing homework on the couch. She finished her homework, checked her Facebook page, and saw that my status had updated to Brian Rutberg is in urgent need of help. Dad! So she yelled dad? back, is everything OK? And I, yeah, everything's just fine. Of course, everything wasn't fine. The hacker was methodically contacting all of Rutberg's Facebook friends, telling them that he was in big trouble. I've been held up at gunpoint in London. I'm here with Sharon and the kids. Of course, they knew my wife's name because she was a friend of mine on Facebook. They could see my pictures. I felt terrible about this because I knew that whoever this was who had taken over my page was going to be trying to reach out to all my friends. That was going to be a headache for me, and I felt terrible for what it was going to do to my friends. The hacker on Rutberg's page was persistent. Before long, he found someone willing to send money to a Facebook friend in need. Rutberg's longtime friend, Benny, stepped up. In the end, he sent over $1,200 in two separate payments through Western Union, and someone in the UK went to the Western Union office and picked it up, claiming to be me. This cry for help scam has its origins centuries ago in the reign of Elizabeth I. Back then, the victims were conned into handing over money to help release Englishmen supposedly locked up in Spanish dungeons. It's known as the Spanish Prisoner Scam. And 400 years later, high-tech descendants have found their way onto Facebook. Facebook is the fastest growing hotbed of computer crime that exists on the internet. There's more crime, spam, scams, malware taking place on Facebook than anywhere else. If, if you want to go into the cybercrime hub of the world, right now, it's Facebook. Facebook responded that, well, this has happened to only about 1% of our users. And then you stop and think that even at the time, they had a quarter of a billion users. And 1% then is 2.5 million. That's a whole lot of people who either are having their pages hacked or who are friends of people having their pages hacked who are the target of scams. A lot of people have not really yet understood how public Facebook is. It feels private to them, but it's not. It's public. And you even get people who don't realize that their profile is completely public. It's searchable on Google, right? And so they can be doing things not just for their friends, but for the entire world without realizing it. Lockport is a small town in upstate New York. As in all small towns, everyone knows everyone, and the police go about their business in the old school, regular way. But in recent years, Captain Richard Podgers has happily adapted to a world in which many people blindly share information on Facebook. I'm not sure people understand how much police use computers. Good hiding place for some, but the careless get caught. This is a story about a careless criminal and how police used Facebook to catch him. I would say Mr. Kriego is uh, kind of an anti-establishment um, type of individual. He's a large, large man, uh, very muscular and strong. In 2009, Christopher Kriego committed a serious assault in a Lockport bar. 
Krigo became angry seeing his ex-girlfriend with another man, and things got violent. Mr. Krigo struck the victim uh, using both his fist and a uh, dangerous object being a beer bottle or glass. Uh, it caused serious injury to the orbit of the eye uh, in New York State. Uh, serious physical injury with a dangerous instrument is classified as an assault second, which is a serious felony. Krigo was arrested and charged. He agreed to a plea bargain, but he skipped town before sentencing and became a fugitive. Richard Podger's job was to find him. It didn't take long before Krigo was on Facebook taunting the police and his assault victim back home. They can't do shit unless I come to New York, so f them. Uh, some of the reactions from his friends were, well, nice, nice pics, Chris, lots of laugh. You're a wanted man. Holy shit, Chris, WTF. Love it, love it, LMAO. Krigo was so confident no one would come to get him, he became careless about what he put on his Facebook page. We learned that uh, he was a tattoo artist in Terre Haute, Indiana, and on the posting on that site, he identified his place of employment. I was able to search the place of employment on the internet. I contacted them by phone, asked when Mr. Krigo would be uh, working, and they, they gave me his hours. Thanks to Krigo's taunting on Facebook, he was arrested and brought back to New York State for sentencing. Well, if it wasn't for the cooperation of um, Mr. Krigo providing us with his, um, his place of employment, the city where he worked, uh, it would have been very hard to find it out. If I was to see Chris Krigo, I think the only thing I would, would do is thank him for all his assistance. A quiet residential neighborhood of Washington, D.C. This is newspaper editor Mark Fisher and his son Aaron, both Facebook users. Facebook friends, in fact. Not long ago, in the sanctity of their own home, they experienced firsthand just how bizarre the new world of Facebook can be. It started on a Friday afternoon. Someone broke into their house through the back door. The burglar worked his way through the rooms, taking anything that caught his eye, including some cash and Aaron's laptop. He also helped himself to a brand new winter coat that had just been delivered from Macy's. The thief was long gone before Aaron got home from school, realized things were missing, and emailed his parents. First thing we knew, we got an email and the subject line was help. The Fishers immediately called the cops and rushed home, arriving just before the officers did. The police uh, threw us out of the house in a matter of seconds uh, so that they could search the house, see if anyone was still here. So far, a routine burglary. But then things took a strange twist. I got a text message from a friend who said, whoa, what's that picture on your Facebook page? I ran upstairs to my dad's desktop computer, which was still there. I go onto Facebook, and sure enough, there's a picture on my Facebook wall. Before he had left the house with Aaron's laptop, the burglar had taken a picture of himself using the laptop camera, and he actually posted it on Aaron's Facebook page for the world to see. Instantly, it all came together, and I called one of the police officers into my office upstairs, and uh, showed him the photo and said, that's your guy. He's wearing a big coat and he kind of has this smirk on his face and he's pointing to the cash um, with his other hand. The cop just kept looking at the screen and saying, I can't believe how stupid this guy is. Because not only did he take control of Aaron's Facebook account, but he then signed off Aaron's Facebook and signed on to his own account using the same computer, the same stolen computer. Police were able to trace the burglar through his Facebook account, and he was arrested and charged. 19-year-old Rodney King pleaded guilty and is now serving time in prison. It's not known whether he still keeps up his Facebook page. 
one of the problems that we humans have is that we're often kind of bad at judging whether or not something we're doing is, is stupid or not, or is gonna look stupid a year from now, you know? Because like, particularly if you're young, you know? Like, your, your identity changes very quickly and the person you are at like 19 might be completely different from the person you are two years later. One of the challenges Facebook has is that, you know, we might put up a photo thinking this is really funny. And then two years later, you're looking for a job and your potential boss is querying this. That stupid picture of you doing that dumb thing is still there exactly as it was the, you know, uh, the day you did it, even if you're four years older. Case in point, the riots in Vancouver, British Columbia after a critical game in North America's ice hockey championships. Literally hundreds of people posed for pictures and videos many of the images destined for Facebook and YouTube. It was as if all that mattered were the pictures themselves, not the consequences sometime down the road. Everything was happening right then, right there, and nowhere else. Which, in the age of social media, is clearly not the case. Dr. Mark Fetterman is an educator and an expert in the way new media is changing the way people connect. The world is today a different place than the world in which many of us grew up. Our experience of the world seems so strange. There are people doing things that seem inappropriate. Old rules don't seem to apply and we're really confused and conflicted about it. Because we're living through a time of massive transformation, the likes of which we haven't seen since the middle of the 16th century. A rich stream of the sights and sounds of that evening in Vancouver was available instantly online. The global connection that social media creates is all-seeing and never forgets. We are all connected. We all do things that affect one another. Uh, we all have an effect on people that we don't even know on far places uh, around the world. So it is important, I think, for all of us to realize that what I do here affects you there, because there is no there, there's only here. And online, everywhere is here and right now can be forever. Immediately following the Vancouver riots, a new Facebook page sprang up. Its purpose was to identify rioters from the available pictures, to name them and publicly shame them. Some people called it an online lynch mob. Regardless, the site is full of pictures of people doing things they never imagined would be seen all over the world. And in real life, if you say something, if you do something, the people in your immediate vicinity will know about it, but really no one else most of the time. Whereas on Facebook, if you say something or do something, uh, the people that follow you will discover that. And some of the people you forgot were following you, that you friended a year or two ago, uh, will see it, potentially. And maybe their friends of friends will see it, and maybe someone will cut and paste it and send it somewhere that you would never have dreamed of. And that is what a lot of people still don't get about Facebook. And pictures like this can be misleading. Who is actually rioting? And who isn't? What we think we see in a Facebook post may not be what is actually going on. It's a little more than an hour's drive from Montreal, Quebec to the small town of Cowansville. Here, a David versus Goliath struggle is being played out. Meet Nathalie Blanchard and her lawyer, Tom Lavin. At the local courthouse, they are preparing to do battle with one of North America's largest insurance companies. In 2009, Nathalie was diagnosed with clinical depression. Her employer's insurance company, Manulife, provided coverage and benefits as Nathalie struggled to recover. My doctor said to me, uh, go out. It's very important for you to go out, uh, see people, see your friends, uh, go in restaurant, go in bar, go everywhere you want. As part of her treatment, as well as going out with friends, the doctor also advised that Nathalie go on a trip. So, she went to Florida with her mother. 
and she put some photos up on Facebook. Somehow, Manulife became aware of the pictures, made a judgment call, and without giving her any other reason, they cut off Natadi's benefits. The issue is not whether or not they can use what is available to them on Facebook. It's how they use it. That is the problem, is the misinterpretation of what is on Facebook. If, uh, hypothetically, you had a person who was diagnosed and suffering from clinical depression, which is a devastating disease, and the person's family takes them away on a vacation just as a change of scenery, the person posts a picture of themselves. If that investigator then says, aha, the person has perpetrated fraud, cut off the benefits, that fundamentally is wrong. When I put the picture on Facebook, it was only to hide the depression. And I didn't think about who's going to see the picture. I just want to make people believe that everything is OK in my life. Cut off from her benefits, Nathalie lost her credit rating and, eventually, her house. You know the old, uh, the old cartoon that we see of a guy that's supposed to be off on disability with a, with a broken back or something like that, and he's, he's mowing his lawn, and the detective is underneath a hedge with a camera? We don't have that anymore. Now we have Facebook, which is the same thing, exactly the same thing, except it's more efficient for the insurance companies uh, to use. No one can make a medical assessment, can make a psychological or psychiatric judgment on the basis out of, of an out-of-context picture posted on Facebook. Nathalie's case goes before a judge in 2012. Insurance investigators, privacy experts, and labor lawyers, literally all over the world, will be glued to the case. British Columbia on Canada's Pacific coast is known for its sometimes scrappy local politics. This is one of its many battlegrounds in downtown Vancouver. In 2009, the Liberal Party ruled this political district. The left-leaning New Democratic Party wanted to change that and they thought they might with a fresh candidate, someone completely new to politics. Their candidate, Ray Lamb, younger than your average politician and ready for a new way of doing things. I saw the potential of Facebook and Twitter and I tried to use that to communicate with my constituents. Facebook did play a part in Ray's campaign, but not at all in the way he imagined it would. Just as it was getting off the ground, his political career came to a sudden and spectacular end. All thanks to some old photos found on Facebook and leaked to the media by his liberal opponent. They were high school photos. In that context, it's fairly innocuous, but uh, the way that the context that it was put in during the campaign made it a lot more volatile than it actually was. In one photo, I'm dancing with a, with a friend of mine and my hand is on her breast. In another photo, um, I have two friends that are looking at my underwear. The pictures, taken years before and mostly forgotten, were preserved in a quiet corner of Facebook. The news wasn't covering NDP policy decisions anymore or the NDP platform. They were talking about these Facebook pictures. I thought they showed a lack of judgment. It's his age, you know, we all recognize that. But when you're in politics and you're going to be a public figure, it's important that you recognize that. Ray took the decision to step down and quit the race. A political career dashed to pieces by some random high school photos. For Ray, it's a lost opportunity and more than a little unfair. You know, for generations, we've been able to move on from bad or dumb things we've done. But in Facebook, social forgetting is a lot harder because that, that photo of that dumb thing you did is still there. It doesn't degrade. So the fear is that Facebook makes social forgetting difficult or impossible. It makes it harder to move on from things you did in the past. When you look at what I've done and what I've been through since high school, the education, the work experience, the experience in the community, that far outweighs what I would have or could have done when I was in high school. Ray's story raises the question, in future years, who will be squeaky clean enough to run for political office?
Sometimes a politician caught in a Facebook bind can fight back. Here in Dublin, folks take their politics seriously. They always have. The Irish have always relished the cut and thrust of political debate. 25-year-old Emma Kiernan wanted to join in. She's from Newbridge, a small town just outside Dublin. In 2009, she decided to run as a local councillor against a tide of much older, more conservative and predominantly male candidates. I wasn't thinking about breaking stereotypes or if it was going to be a male-female thing. I just more focused that this is what I want to do. With the campaign in full swing, Emma became a much bigger story than she could have predicted, and all because of a photo that surfaced on Facebook. I think at the moment when the picture was taken, it was probably about two o'clock in the morning. Um, we'd all been enjoying ourselves for most of the night, and a song came on that we all just liked, and we started dancing. We were dancing, yeah. <laughs> Embarrassingly so. It's not very uh, attractive. <laughs> The photo quickly became a major news story. A debate raged back and forth, fueled by what some voters saw as a scandalous picture. This photograph doesn't bother me, it doesn't insult me. It's a great memory of a great night out, so I have no problem with it being out there. I just have a problem with how people would treat me or perceive me after looking at it. That's more so what I'd have a problem with. Despite righteous indignation from some quarters and demands that she resign her candidacy, Emma decided to ride it out. I felt, well, you know what, that's me, that's how it is. At this stage, I had done so much work in the election that I wasn't going to let that go to waste. I thought, no, I'm still going to run, I'm not stepping down, that's the end of it. Um, now we'll see if people really like me or don't. Imagine, for instance, this. In 20 or 30 years' time, our country's new politicians, their leaders, all of their indiscretions at university, all of those wild parties, they will be well documented on Facebook and they'll be there for any tabloid journalist to come and pick up. And it could be happening to you as well, not just celebrities. So there could be information about you which you're posting online which could eventually cause you problem in your job or in your relationships, or just simply be embarrassing. Emma Kiernan's free spirit approach clearly had appeal to younger voters. Some of them started a Facebook page to urge support for her campaign. And as it turned out, on election day, she was victorious. It was a political fight with Facebook as a key factor, sending a clear message. I do think I was a bit naive about Facebook. If you are going to get into something like politics, you need to be very careful about how you use it. As an individual, people will like you or they won't like you on the basis of what they see on that. And they'll make a judgment call based on image. Another Facebook case involving a photo that attracted unwanted attention happened in the Bahamas in 2009. Imagine you're on holiday. Life is good. It's a great day for a barbecue, and the cocktails are exactly right. Enter Alexander Rust, 24 years old, from Indiana, a big fan of barbecues. It's what he barbecued that caused a ruckus. He and his girlfriend caught and cooked up an iguana, an endangered species of iguana, as it turned out. As people do on holiday, they posted pictures on Facebook, including a shot of the illegal barbecue. To their astonishment, they were charged, prosecuted, convicted, and fined under Bahamas Animal Protection Act. Before the age of Facebook, who would have known? And who would have thought a charity car wash could cause a problem? Well, it did in South Carolina last year at a small town police department. An officer on duty stopped by to have his police car washed by women wearing bikinis. Inevitably, someone took photos, and the pictures landed on Facebook. The local police chief was not amused. He said it was a violation of the rules governing the use of police vehicles. It reflected badly on the force. The officer in question was fired. You see how this works? Someone posts a picture, 
big problem for someone else. With all this trouble caused by Facebook postings, surely somewhere Facebook has changed family life for the better. The answer is, of course, yes. With almost three quarters of a billion users in the world, Facebook has helped to make some unexpected family connections. Inside this house in a quiet neighborhood of Regina, Canada, lives someone who has struggled with a fundamental question his whole life. I never had a father's arm around my shoulders. I just never had a father in my life. Meet Jim Toth, educator, artist, world traveler, and one-time magician. Jim's parents split up when he was very young, too young for him to remember his father. And while he did have a stepfather, the identity of his birth father stayed a family secret for decades. I did genealogy searches. I went to the archives in Saskatchewan. I even went through the Mormons to try and find out something about my birth name. And I could get nothing. Yeah, you have to go up to the search bar at the oh, top. OK. That all changed the day his granddaughter, Janelle, introduced him to something new on the computer. Under Joseph. Uh, maybe try Joseph. She typed in whatever she needed, and up came Facebook. I said, now, you can search for people on this thing, can't you? She said, yes. I said, OK, I want you to help me. OK, try Porkalab. And all of a sudden, up came the name Porkalab with a little thumb, thumb sketch of a person. Oh, I was surprised, because I didn't expect it. I mean, it was, it was the first connection I have made that was positive right in front of my eyes, a picture. And I, in time, I discovered that this was my half-nephew that I discovered. And he was the one that connected me to my half-brother, just like that. More than 50 years of searching resolved in a few minutes on Facebook. Hello, Jim. Well, I don't know quite how to say this, but your father was my grandfather. That moment. That line gave me the connection that for 50 years I was looking for. Your father is my grandfather. I made it. 50 years of searching, I made it. And Facebook was what enabled me to make that connection. So these little brokerages of personal contact that could never easily have happened or never happened at all in the past, uh, you know, happen daily now. And th this is this is the delightful stuff. This is why people sort of, even if they're tortured by it, keep returning to the Facebook well, is because he, these magical things still happen. And you know, being connected is so very important. And if Facebook is the avenue and the channel for enabling you to be connected, by all means, use it and go there. It did, it connected me. And I'm so happy to be connected now. Jim met with his new family members this summer. What was lost has been found, thanks to Facebook. We keep hearing that Facebook is all about making connections. So how about a love story unfolding inside this house near Fort Lauderdale, Florida? Meet two young people with a lot in common, including something you might not expect. My name is Kelly Hildebrandt. My name is Kelly Hildebrandt. K-E-L-L-Y. Hildebrandt. H-I-L-D-E-B-R-A-N-D-T. How many pancakes do you want? For Kelly Hildebrandt and Kelly Hildebrandt, life together began on Facebook. It happened because I was bored one night and uh, I was late and I was searching for my account on Facebook and I typed my name into the search bar and he came up and I saw him on the screen and I was shocked that there was another person named Kelly Hildebrandt and that he was a boy. <laughs> so I sent him a message. She's just like, hi, how's it going? We have the same name. And next thing I know, I'm flying to Florida to meet the other Kelly Hildebrandt. Of course, we found out that we had a lot in common other than just our names. Before I came out, I told my uh, pastor that if she's the same person face-to-face -face that she is 
over the phone that she's the girl for me. As it turned out, Kelly was the right girl for Kelly. Having made sure they weren't directly related in any way, the two of them got married in a Facebook fever. The chances are one in a million's million. The odds of someone having the exact same name, meeting 1,600 miles apart, and then just everything clicking and happening like it did um, was just amazing. The story of Kelly and Kelly's million to one chance meeting has been reported all over the world. And it even became fodder for the late night talk shows. You know you're famous when Conan O'Brien makes a joke about your story. He told our story. He told you know, our Kelly, story. Kelly Hildebrand marries Kelly Hildebrand. And just recently, 100 men changed their name to Megan Fox. Yeah, on, on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> part of the fundamental human condition to connect. There's that almost trite cliche that says, a stranger is a friend I haven't met yet. And in a world that is in such proximity, that's a marvelous thought to hold. Before Facebook, I would have never met Kelly. So I think that it shifted the way my life was headed. I am indebted to Facebook. <laughs> for my beautiful wife. <laughs> because if it wasn't for Facebook, I would never have met the other Kelly Hildebrandt. If Facebook is about hooking up, it's also sometimes about breaking up. Some people think one of Facebook's most inspired ideas is what's called relationship status. It quickly signals who's available and who isn't. And sometimes Facebook itself plays a leading role in the drama. Lowell, Massachusetts is the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. Long ago, Lowell boomed with textile mills, which worked the cotton from the south. The mills are closed now, and in recent years, Lowell has struggled to redefine itself. This is where we find Ken Savage, a man who has gone through some redefinition of his own thanks to Facebook. My ex-wife used Facebook, I think, in the beginning to reach out to friends, but as soon as she started to see the power of it, she connected with some old boyfriends. We can all guess where this is heading. Sure enough, Ken's wife cheated on him, and he caught her doing it. I think Facebook brought upon the end of my marriage much quicker than it would have been. The communication wasn't there. She took her focus away from me and put it onto Facebook. And I think it made her realize as well that this is over, this is not what I want. I'm, I'm gonna get what I want through Facebook much easier. You will hear stories, and I'm sure they're true, of couples who are like, well, I'm, I'm in the room and I'd like to talk to my spouse, my partner, but they're staring at Facebook, you know? Because there's this very rich stream of social signals that are fascinating and that person just can't pull away even though there's someone sitting across the room who's, you know, supposed to be married to them. Ken and his wife split up. I told family members what's going on, why I moved out. Um, I said my wife is cheating on me using Facebook and they giggled and said, how do you do that? In attempting to answer the question, Ken created a website of his own. The website is called facebookcheating.com. There's a section here uh, that I talk uh, more. This is one busy website, up to 50,000 hits in a typical month. Clearly, Ken is not alone. And there's an article here about uh, divorces from social media sites like Facebook are on the rise. In a recent study conducted by a U.S. law firm, one in five marital affairs had a clear Facebook connection. Ken has lived through it, a marriage lost, and a new partner found, believe it or not, both on Facebook. And the final twist, Ken now makes money on a site he created all about Facebook cheating. It comes as no surprise that people routinely use Facebook to find partners. For many, social media is a shortcut to getting down to business. But these days, Facebook is definitely not just for the kids. This is Clive Worth, a retired coal miner in his early 60s and an avid user of Facebook. We are 
It's not all that unusual to find senior citizens who have Facebook accounts. But Clive is different. He uses Facebook in a way the social networking site says it never intended, and that it frowns upon. In his small house in a Welsh village, Clive spends hours a day on his unique Facebook collection. This is Alison, one of many women who know it's me that I've dated. This is Brenda, Angela, Jess, Ellie, Ahmed, Serena, Tracy, Andresa, Jane, Jessica, Marie, Chrissy, Augusta, okay. For Clive, the phrase Facebook friend takes on a whole new meaning. Facebook to me is a sex book. Because to me, Facebook is for having a lot of sex on. Clive's not talking about virtual sex. He's talking about hooking up for the real thing. Facebook has already banned him six times, but Clive keeps coming back with new identities. And why wouldn't he? There's millions and millions of women on Facebook and most of them are divorced and single and looking for a good time. Such a good time, apparently, that Clive has become a bit of a media sensation. His exploits have been reported on television, on the radio, and in countless newspaper and magazine articles. He's become an international story. Thanks specifically to Facebook, Clive says he has betted more than 350 women. Once I got on Facebook, they started contacting me, wanting to date me, because they had seen me on TV and they knew I was an author with a book out. When I first started dating on Facebook, I was able to date as many as four or five women a week. But now I've got a bit older, I'm down to two a week. I'm slowing down a bit now. Facebook itself is not happy with Clive Worth, it's not part of the corporate image to be a giant sex club. Clive, he wouldn't have it any other way. Social media brings us together in countless ways. For people at the beginning of life's journey, it's impossible to imagine the world without texting and Twitter and Facebook. For those near the journey's end, Facebook has raised some interesting questions about what we leave behind. This is Abney Park, a huge Victorian cemetery in London. There are thousands of people buried here, but it's impossible to get a sense of who they were in life. What did they look like? Who were their friends? Who did they love? Elaine Casket is a psychologist at the University of London. She has made a study of how we mourn our loved ones. They created big cemeteries like this in the Victorian period, and it reflected the society in which people lived, not just the needs of that society who needed a place to bury their dead, but the tastes of societies this cold granite or stone engraved thing. What is that of you? How is that a representation of the self? It's not, but a Facebook profile is. The way that people commune with the dead reflect the way that people live. We live in a social networking age. It makes total sense, therefore, that people are going to commune with people who die via social networking media, because that's the way our society is set up. I'm gonna walk with the Prince of Peace away down, down by the riverside, away down, down by These are family and friends gathered together to say goodbye to Wilma Jones. She is going to be sadly missed by us all because she was loved by us all. Wilma was a Facebook user. After she died in 2010, her page stayed up, and people started leaving posts on her wall for everyone to see. I love you, Wilma, and I know that heaven has accepted you with open arms. Since you're there, give all the family a big hug and kiss for me. If you're a really avid Facebook user and you post lots of things and you have lots of friends and lots of conversations and lots of comments on photographs and all these kinds of things, 
it's an incredibly rich and complex record of who you were, not just who you were as an individual, but who you were in the context of all of your relationships, including your relationships with the people that you leave behind when you die. Jesse, okay? She's just like love. That's what Wilma is love. That's all, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you, Jesse. I think she's a testament to what we need to remember, what life is about. For a lot of people, it seems like continuing to communicate with somebody on Facebook feels like the most real, most connected kind of way that they can really speak to somebody and have faith that they're being heard. And that's quite powerful stuff. Hey, Auntie. I find it so weird and yet so comforting that whenever I want to talk with you, I can come on Facebook and write on your wall. It's almost as if when I press enter, I can be certain that my message is being sent straight to heaven. So one does wonder whether, in the future, one wonders whether there will still be places like this, full of grave markers like those that surround me here, because when it's hard to imagine the need for it when there is such a vivid representation of the person that you lost right there in front of you on your computer screen or on your phone screen. Thank you, everybody. Oh. We're ready for now. When we're young, we tend to think of ourselves as immortal. What does it matter who sees pictures of us in unguarded moments? Having fun, speaking our minds, who cares? Well, Ray Lamb does. So does Nathalie Blanchard, and Paul Chambers, and Cameron Riley, and Anthony Weiner, and any one of thousands of rioters in Vancouver. And on and on it goes, all over the world people's reputations being undone by the use of social media. If you're not prepared to go to the middle of your city centre and get a loud hailer and shout out your personal information through that, don't put it on the internet. Anything which you don't want becoming public, you should never post on the internet because you're effectively putting your trust in a company to keep your personal information secret and that isn't always their business model. Whatever Facebook's business model is, it's working, and it's up to the rest of us to figure out how to adapt. Living digitally, living partly online and partly on offline, is always gonna have this push and pull of weird tensions. So it may be that we wind up in an even stickier wicket than we're in right now with Facebook. The next generation of social media will be upon us before we know it. And one far off day, Facebook and Twitter will seem as quaint as the telegraph. It's not that Facebook or Twitter will change society. They're merely a grease for the wheels. They help move along a change that we're passing through now that will yet take another 150 or so years to be fully realized. Once we come out the other end, it will be a very, very different world. <laughs>